may sound familiar. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Let me consent. Um, so most recently before Google, I was at Nordstrom where I used to work on the core customer shopping journey and product page. Um, if it was if it was easy for or enjoyable for you to evaluate items and purchase anything digitally from Nordstrom um, over the past year, I was responsible. Um, I was part of the team that was responsible for making that happen. So I sincerely hope that it was a pleasant ex experience for you. I love Nordstrom too. Um, I've also designed for trust at Airbnb, designing internal tools uh, that help keep the platform safe. And I've also worked on updates for uh, the translator experience uh, for the translator app at Microsoft and have a handful of experience um, designing enterprise tools to help companies develop applications or modernize and, and scale. Um, but before I became a designer um, working at these mostly tech companies, let's take a step back. Thank you, Troy. Um, this is where I spent almost all of my time in undergrad. This is a print shop. It's the print studio um, at my undergrad. And as a former printmaker, I really just loved how this medium had historically connected humans to the written language in forms of books or signing or, or signage. And I think that printing, what printmaking did or what printing did was help to make information widely available, uh, reproducible, accessible, and when executed really well with proper communications design, it made information really easy to understand. And I particularly loved uh, serigraphy, which is also known as silk screen or um, screen printing, uh, because it's really unpretentious. It's really flexible, and there is a very DIY or do-it-yourself approach to this particular um, type of printmaking. And in many ways, I think that UX design is like printmaking. Um, we design experiences that are intentional and informative to influence how um, people are going to engage with your work. Um, we're communicating information. So this evening, um, Drory and I will share resources that we both hope are really useful in helping you to tell a story that really honors your background and your values uh, to your prospective employers. And um, thanks again, Melissa and HCDE for having us, um, having me back tonight. Um, I'll let Drory take it away. Holy cow, that's a hard act to follow. Angela, that was great. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, uh, let's see how I do here. Um, where do I wanna start? Uh, let's see. Um, hi, my name is Drory. It's spelled D-R-O-R-Y. Uh, there'll be a quiz at the end. If you can pronounce it, you win. Uh, and uh, I just love scary big problems. Uh, I'm currently head of UX at Zonar Systems, where we make sure that we are keeping people safe around big rolling pieces of metal. Um, the focus for our organization is commercial fleet logistics and management. So anything that's involved uh, with getting things from one location to another on ground, uh, be they packages or people, um, that's really what we focus on. <laughs> Previously, I also worked here, and I also worked here and here. I uh, had my own design studio in the 90s for a couple of years, and then I got acquired by a dot-com startup in January 2000, which didn't really last that long because we all remember summer of 2000, right? Yeah. Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> uh, I'm a graduate from uh, UW School of Business, uh, Go Dogs. I mentor and guest lecture here, and I'm on the advisory board here. I'm in my 50s which means I was born in the 70s, I'm a child of the 80s, and I've been a design, designer of some form or the other since the 90s. And lest my boyish good looks deceive you, uh, that's my actual bit bar mitzvah picture, Jufro and all. In my spare time, I like to read as much as I can. <clears throat> it's one of the ways that I've learned to really keep uh, my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the industry and what's going on in the various markets that I'm interested in. And plus it's just, <clears throat> it's fun. It lets me pick and choose what I need to learn in the moment. I also do a little bit of writing, do a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and I'm learning how to do this. 
And yes, it's as fun as it looks. <clears throat> I also tell people I have two superpowers. I'm dyslexic and I have ADHD, which means I'm a global thinker and faster than normal. Everybody got all that? Awesome. Okay. So <clears throat> this is where the audience participation portion comes in. What made these stories engaging? <clears throat> I'm gonna answer the question in the chat of what was that you just saw? It is officially called Rally. Yep, Dirtfish. Out in Sequami, try it, it's great. So uh, this is open mic time. Feel free to unmute or chat in the comments. <clears throat> what made these stories engaging? What made Angel's story engaging? And hopefully what made my story engaging? I don't know. If you didn't think it was engaging, we're also open to hear that. Talk, talk to us. I feel like I haven't talked to anyone all day. I know. <laughs> I've talked to a lot of people today. So please, please talk to me. Fine to <laughs> you can talk to Angel. Okay. <laughs> you want me to read them? You want me to read them, read, read them out? The same so things I could identify with. They were personal, cadence, Angel's unique passion, slip screen. Yes. Uh, I, I had a thought. Um, oh. Yeah, with, with Angel's story specifically, um, just hearing about like your transition into uh, what you're doing now i think that was engaging for me at least because i'm i'm sharing that experience right now of like moving from one industry to another um that are on i would argue opposite ends of each other um but yeah i thought that was, that was great just to hear like someone's like i don't know origin story i guess and same with jory too just like you know you you mentioned um yeah just starting uh just like your childhood your upbringing all the way to to now um designer since mm -hmm. the 90s and stuff. I, I, I always like hearing about where people start and where they are now. It always gives like perspective, I guess. Like we didn't just get here in a blink of an eye, um, which is always like reassuring mm -hmm. to me. Yep. I think it was the um, passion in both of your guys' voices and then the way that you did describe the things that you like to do outside of HCDE and that sort of thing. As well as for Drory, it was also um, uh, sh uh, showing some of his vulnerability and how he uh, turned that around um, to his advantage. Okay, relatable and seeing <clears throat> scene setting. Uh, like the visuals and how those visuals enhanced both of the stories. Yeah, it's Mindset. too bad we can't do visuals on LinkedIn like that. <laughs> well, apparently we're working on it because you've got that kind of like paginating slideshow thing that you that you can do. Um, that'd be a you good. You can't experience. put emojis in there, right? You can put emojis in there, right, Dory? Uh, it depends. I mean, if you upload a PDF, it will play it as a slideshow. Apparently. Um, you know, it requires a little bit of, you know, orchestrating, but it's possible. I just wish we could put gifts and comments because, you know, come on, LinkedIn. <laughs> okay, great way to introduce yourself. All right, uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep rolling. So that leads us to talking about the first topic. Um, there's various schools of thought on this, but um, we'll share ours. Uh, the quality is an engaging story. Uh, we've heard a few of those in the chat, but um, at least from my perspective, uh, this is kind of where they roll up. First and foremost, it has to be simple. Like good stories are easy to understand. They're also told in a language that matches the way the intended audience communicates. So the audience doesn't need to spend time interpreting and then absorbing this information. They are engaging. They're most of the memorable stories infuse just the right amount of humor or pain or joy, sometimes all three, um, keeps the audience focused. If every story was simply the facts were stated one after another, and most of us wouldn't listen or remember any of it because it's very monotonous and boring. Um, you know, we've all been to lectures like that. It's truthful, not truth in the kind of scientific, you know, evidentiary sense, but you know, it's insofar as the storyteller believes what they're saying and they're actually honest with themselves and their audience about what they're talking about. And I was struggling with a fourth term. There's a lot of different terms, but it really does it does the story fulfilling. 
mean, it, it, does it take the reader or the audience somewhere else and make them glad that they went? I mean, people aren't going to re really remember exactly what you said or did, but they're, they're going to retain how you made them feel and how the story made them feel. I mean, if the audience walks away feeling that hearing your story was worth their time, great. And they also think, hey, cool, I learned something new today. That's even better. So when we think about that in terms of an engaging story, that's you know, it's pretty much par for the course. But when we got into this topic of, okay, what about telling a personal story? So what is it? What does that mean? And I think a lot of people, including myself, have struggled with this for years. I mean, but one of the things that became really clear to me was make sure that you're being as unapologetic about it as you can. I mean, your personal narrative is the story of you as a uniquely awesome individual. Everybody's journey is different. Don't downplay, dismiss, insult, or ignore the path that brought you to this moment in your career. See it for what it is and honor it as a part of what makes you, you, because if you don't do that, hiring managers, organizations, corporate, they're gonna pick up on that kind of inauthenticity. Um, so don't apologize for the journey that you've got. You know, humble. My mother always said that there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. So while you shouldn't apologize for any part of your career journey, you also want to take care not to embellish your story with concepts or elements that you may not fully understand yet, because chances are someone in the audience is going to understand it, and they're probably going to ask you about it. And while I call this out separately to make a point, my last term that I settled on, it really is a culmination of everything above, and you've heard me use this term before just a moment ago. But one of my mentors, who's an amazing writer, like, told me that the two best ways to have a story feel authentic is one, write the way you speak, and two, know what the heck you're talking about. So in order to tell an authentic story about yourself, it's important to know yourself as well as you can first. And this is where the core of what Angel and I wanted to talk about really came from. How do you get clear on what you stand for, what drives you to pursue this career path? Your this I believe, this I do set of principles, your, your personal values, which lets me segue into Take It Away Angel. All right. Thanks so much, Troy. So we are going to have a conversation today about, it, it says it's professional uh, and personal values, but essentially what it dwindles down to is your core values. So the conversation that I think we're going to have today is as much about telling your story as it is about really understanding who you are and understanding that story that you want to tell. And this is the message that you want to communicate about yourself um, and about the work that you want to do. And, and this, this is important because I, I know that many of you are looking for new career opportunities or this might be your first career out of school. And I want these opportunities to be really exciting for you. Um, uh, a former manager had introduced me to this exercise for a performance review. And what I really appreciated about it was how it helped me to clearly um, reflect and capture how I am making an impact in the work that I do today. Um, so we'll, we'll go over that in a, in a moment. Um, I have another personal story, but I also wanted to share that when I first started my design career, which was about six years ago, I was so eager to take on just about any project. Um, and I hope that I'm not the only person who did this or you know, at the time did this, but I would go off, I would find myself uh, different companies. I would go to their about their mission page and I would just soak up that mission statement and this was how I kind of visualized in my head um, how I would envision myself at these companies. And while this worked sometimes and this helped expose me to lots of different projects and opportunities, what I learned was that sometimes there was just a huge mismatch 
in the way that I find satisfaction and joy in the work that I do and the way that I live and this thing that I was working on or this project um, that I was trying to find value in. And this, what this learning experience taught me is that my own values are important and um, that I have a unique perspective to offer with different companies and teams, just like you do. And the more that you are able to make clear to those around you um, the type of work that you, you want to do, um, I hope that this can help you be more honest with yourself. So this, this value exercise is one that we'll introduce you to today. And I think it's a great tool for discovering the values that resonate with you if, if you haven't uh, thought and reflected on, on what those are yet. Um, and if, again, if you have a job and you're satisfied with it, I hope that this, um, this activity is one that you'll be able to bring into your performance reviews uh, to, see how, um, to see how your projects and, and your work are living up to those values that are important to you. Um, but to kick it off, um, let's talk about values. Um, I, I would love to discuss and try to, I, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think a value is? And why do you think, why do you think these val that values matter? And we can use the same format, either speak up or chat. Let's see who's going to be brave enough to unmute first. Values reflect who you are. Um, I, I could speak up if that's okay. Can everyone hear yeah. me? Um, yeah, I think that like as we are all experiencing living through the pandemic really highlights a certain like public and private conception of what our values are and like brings to the fore what we prioritize in terms of what is important to us and how we live that out. And so the values are the, the way that we are living through and acting out what we think is most important to see in the world. Love it. I think also, I think also, um, values well to me um my values are something that come with me wherever i go so whatever employer i have or client i have if my values clash with theirs i can't do that work it's not a match and um i want to work with with or for someone whose values align with mine otherwise you know, and I've had, I've had, um, I've had an entire career. I'm, I'm a career changer. Um, I have had jobs where I had to leave because I was being asked to do things where I didn't think I could look at myself in the mirror if I did them. And so my values are something that are intrinsic to me and to my work. And if I think I don't want to put my name on that, then that's not work I should be doing that doesn't reflect my values. Thanks, Trudy. I would say values are kind of traits that we want to see in ourselves and other people in the world. So like I value being transparent and communicating with other people who are empathetic and I value justice. And the flip side is like, I when I see uh, injustice, um, for example, I want to do something about it. Then I see that my work is causing injustice. I don't want to do that work. And maybe when I see that people uh, in my job um, don't hold the same values for personal uh, ways of being, um, that could cause problems, but maybe, maybe not as much. Mm -hmm. Totally. Nice. Uh, I, th I think we've heard these themes of um, 
some words that I jotted down, like how you prioritize. Um, they follow you, they're intrinsic. There are these traits, right? Um, and I've also, what I've also heard is that um, these are the things that really attract you to um, values kind of point you to like work that attracts you or um, the way that you want to live your life. And if, if you're, I've also heard this theme of if you are not reflecting these values in a certain way that um, it might lead to dissatisfaction, maybe unhappiness. So values are the things that really define you as a human they are the things that you believe to be important to the way that you live and to the way that you, um, that the way that you live and work. And yes, it, it is, um, you know, everyone, it resonates differently with everyone, but it is hard to like pinpoint um, that definition. But I feel like um, even if you don't always live your values, it's good to kind of have, um, values that you would aspire to. Um, so I have I've shared a list of um, like a word bank that will be shared out um, after today's session, but let's kick off the, um, this, this exercise, um, which is in four steps, but if you jump to the next slide, please. Um, what we're gonna do first is to take a look together at this um, sort of values word bank um, that this was, this was shared with me earlier. It's not a definitive list of values, um, but it's something that I hope that you'll be able to take away today. Um, this is an activity that I personally spent like an hour working on um, because there are a lot of words on this list. Um, and, and this is optional, but um, if you have a mentor or a friend or a peer who can participate in this activity with you, um, I invite you to um, see if they would be able to participate with you um, because sometimes you might be drawn to certain values, but it's interesting to see how other people see you live out your values. Um, Next slide, please. So again, we have this list of many, many words, many value words. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm just kind of gonna walk through this activity. I, again, hope that it's something that you can take away at, at the end of the session today and, and, um, and work on. But I would like you to, um, Take a, take a look and, and read through every single one of these words. Um, what we see are words like ability, acceptance, discovery, growth, um, mindfulness, the list goes on. But I want you to take a look at this and use a highlighter or pen, pen and mark the words that jump out at you um, that are immediate. Try not to, to spend too much time um, wondering about the definition of the word, um, but see what resonates really well with you. Um, I mark 20 to 30, it's a huge list, so it, there's a lot to choose from, but choose 20, 30, 35. Um, and what you'll notice is that a lot of these words might start to sound familiar. And if it does, that's okay because you will start to find patterns and trends. Um, and before, we, before we, we group these words and you start to establish these patterns, um, I wanted to point out that I recognize that if English isn't your first language, there may be some words on here that don't match the values that speak to who you are. Um, but that's completely okay um, because this is such an open-ended, um, flexible activity. It's kind of like printmaking. You, you make it what it is. Um, but if there is a 
maybe a phrase that resonates with you and isn't captured in a word, it's okay. Just, just write that down. Um, and later you can reflect on it to see if there is a word that fits, fits in well with it. Um, and I've already mentioned um, asking a peer or mentor, mentor to do this activity with you too. Um, next slide. I'll share out what I, the first time that I did this activity, these were the words that um, kind of stood out to me. Um, ambition, beauty, belonging, boldness, commitment, the list goes on. Um, and what I really like about this activity is that the words that I picked, the words that Jory may pick, and the words that you may pick might be completely different. And that's totally okay because we're all human and we're all different. And um, what it might mean is that if we do have values that align, um, we may be drawn to similar things. Um, but we talked about a little bit earlier about mismatch in values. It's just really good to understand what works for you or what kind of drives you um, so that when you find work projects, companies to work for um, or people to be around even um, that, you know, there, there isn't a clash in values. Um, so yes, next is just define. This is another really fun and flexible part of this, um, this activity. Um, and it's the definition stage. In, in your terms, you get to define exactly what these values mean um, to you. I'll show you what that might that looked like for me. So I found words that were um, kind of fell into these two main buckets or two main categories. Um, and that was kindness and trust. And I thought about how this relates to me in the workplace. Like there is this association with the word kindness um, that, or in my head, an association with the word kindness that means maybe you're more reserved or you're meek or you're quiet um, and soft-spoken. Um, or those were the immediate terms that, that stood out to me. But I feel like those who know me well know that I am maybe none of those things. I can actually be very loud, um, very involved and engaged. Um, so it was important for me to design to define what kindness meant for me. And so I define this as not being meek, um, not being ambivalent or overshadowed. Um, but what it is is being deliberate and being honest, um, committed, creative, justice, um, mutual respect, and assuming best intent. It, it was, you know, that's not a complete sentence, but these were the things that resonated to me when I defined the word kindness. And I also found a lot of, um, a lot of terms or a lot of values that fit into this category of trust as like a primary, um, a primary value. And I defined trust as a firmness or confidence in a person or an idea and a process. And I found that there was sort of this overlap between kindness and trust. Um, the, and you'll, you'll see that the, the yellow stickies at the bottom were the words that were in the last step of the exercise that kind of funneled into um, this definition of kindness and trust. Um, so this is something that I use for myself personally in a, um, in a performance review. Um, I had asked earlier for you to recruit a friend or family member or a peer or mentor to, um, to participate in this because it's really fulfilling and satisfying when you can see that the things that are important to you um, like other people see that that is reflected too. Um, I 
so with this next step, it's a reflection. Um, it's asking yourself how the roles that you apply for align with your values, or if they, if these values align to the feedback um, that you receive. So what that meant for me was um, in my performance reviews, I, you know, I've written about these things that I've accomplished, things I've done, but I've also solicited feedback from my colleagues. And there, are, I had noticed, um, I had noticed feedback that really aligned to um, kind of establishing trust in the way that I partner with engineers. Uh, that's a relationship that's so important to me. Um, establishing trust and communication um, and approaching with um, kind of like an open, an open mind. There's like, there's a kindness to that. So it was really satisfying for me to see that in the projects that I had taken on with this particular company that I was working with, that my peers and my colleagues saw how my personal values were reflected in the, the work that I did. And that was really, really satisfying um, to me. But I would like to say, you know, this is also so important if you are looking for your first job or if you are even not, even if it's not your first job, if you are career seeking right now, like, you know, we had heard themes of making sure that your values match up with, um, with these roles that you're applying for. Um, because at the end of the day, I think that it gives you um, satisfaction and um, kind of an honesty, um, an honesty with yourself. And it, this was, um, you know, a short and sweet kind of walkthrough of this exercise, but it's one that's really helped me. And I hope that it's something that you can take away that will be helpful for you as well. Thanks. That's awesome. Um, does anybody in the audience have questions for Angel? Are there anything that's confusing or uh, you'd like her, like her to clarify in terms of the exercise? No, but I have a question about like, <clears throat> have you had feedback that uh, like what you what you've done at your work doesn't align with your values and what's that been like? The question that I heard was, have I gotten feedback that does not align with my values? The, the, the feedback about your your what you do at work. Feedback about what I do at work that does not align with my values. Um, I don't know, I, 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 I don't know if some of the feedback that I've gotten has like, if my peers are specifically thinking of like certain like per particular values. Um, I think it's more in terms of like, um, I guess hearing feedback about Hold on, I'm spinning in circles. I wanna make sure that I understood that question correctly. Um, so you said that you it feels really good to hear people um, validate that, um, that that they see these as your values and they see you living them. But as you said, you don't always, I mean, you may not always. And, um, so are you saying Ben, that if, she, if, if Angel were to get feedback that she was not trustworthy on a particular incident or it, something like that? Yeah, right, if a value is trust, that would be an example, yeah. Well, the, the thing is that these are, you know, values that I keep to usually to myself. I, I shared them out as examples just so y'all could see how I kind of process through this activity, but it's not something where I go into my team and say like, hey, these are my, you know, this is very important to me, like, you know, it's something that I keep at top of mind in the things that I do, um, but it's it's more of like an alignment when I when I receive feedback that matches how I personally feel about myself or how I like to live. That's really, I guess, um, validating. Right. But, um, 
but I guess like going into this, I don't know if my partners, my colleagues would specifically say like um, Angel values trust. So um, here's how it shows up in her work. It's more of like a self-reflection kind of activity. Sure. I think if I, if I could yes and to what Angel's talking about, <clears throat> I think um, the type of feedback that comes in uh, to Angel's point is like, we're not, we're not walking around with t-shirts, although that might be cool, um, t-shirts with our values on them. Um, <clears throat> but it's something that um, if, we're, if we're relatively clear about it, are things that are core to how we move through the world. And I can actually, I can recall times in my past where I grew up in a family where you know, honesty was one of the, like probably the number one value. Like, you know, the Ben Menachem word is better than a written contract. So if you say you're gonna do something, you better do it. Um, and I remember, I remember the feeling that when I got feedback in some of my early jobs, it said, hey, um, you said you were gonna have this delivered by the deadline, or you know, you said that this actually got done and turns out it didn't get done. <clears throat> um, it didn't feel very good. I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a cause for me to kind of reevaluate or, or kind of question my own values, but it was, it was a learning opportunity for me to say, oh, I can reflect on my behavior and go, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, so it's it, it's not necessarily a very explicit thing, but it's uh, it it's really part of that how how you take that moment to reflect and reorient yourself to say, oh, okay, I need to make sure that how I'm acting in how I'm acting in private is how I present myself in public. Make sure those two are congruous. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin had a question. Has reflecting on your values shifted your career trajectory in a meaningful way? But that's a good question. I think it definitely has for me. Um, going back to that example that I used about kindness, um, you know, I had mentioned how like what first comes to mind with kindness for me is just like a um, how do I want to define kindness? Like, there's like a gentleness to it, right? And so when I first started my career, um, I, my very first UX design job, I was, um, I worked with all men. I was the only woman in this room of all men where I struggled to make my voice heard oftentimes. And when I sat with the word um, kindness, and this was, you know, this was before I had done this evaluation activity. It's just something that has always sat with me. But when I first started my career, like I had a really hard time standing up and articulating these decisions that I had made in my work or um, being really firm, right? Um, and over time, um, over time, the word kindness shifted for me from something that was, you know, just being agreeable or just being um, easy to work with um, and, and helpful to something that was um, kind but firm. Kind means, um, you know, yes, I might see, um, you know, points that are, points or comments that are, are different in, in a room of people who <clears throat> may be tough stakeholders, but like I approach it in a firm manner in a way that is also direct and confident. Like it, it's, um, I really appreciated how like I could still stay true to that core value, even though the meaning of it might have shifted over the years or um, kind of evolved over the years. Yes, um, wonderful comment value, um, from Akshay. Mm -hmm. 
values tend to evolve with us as we encounter new experiences and situations and thus can change over time. Um, exactly what I was trying to communicate. Yeah, and he has a he has a really interesting question, like how often do you reevaluate re yourself or when do you consider reevaluating yourself? Um, I personally do a, a year end reflection and rejuvenation um, ritual. Um, it's become part of something that I learned from a mentor years ago, and it's been really valuable to me. What about you, Angel? Um, so I do this thing where every, like the very first day of every year, I start a new journey and I, or journal, sorry, I start off a new journal at the first day of every year. And I write, <clears throat> I write value words that like really resonate with me for that year. So similar to you, Drury, like you know, I do kind of like a recalibration at the end of every year. And I decide to take these intentional words with me into every new year. And at the, um, I like to, I journal all the time. Um, I have a career journal and I like to reflect on whether or not this has shown up in different projects that I do or interactions that I've had with um, my colleagues. Um, but it also comes, I, I do it with every performance review cycle too. Like this helps me to kind of keep in, in check with myself um, and to make sure that I'm honoring uh, myself and the things that are, are important to me. Um, and I found that through the years, I've just kind of stuck to a couple of values. Like what I, what I showed y'all in this activity um, might be a little bit outdated, but it's not too far off from the value words that I would pick for myself today. Um, it, it might have evolved a little bit or I might define it a little bit differently, um, mm -hmm. but it's nice to see that, it's, that these words have just kind of followed me throughout my career and my life. I would, uh, I would echo that. Um, and both with the uh, journaling and trying to do the, uh, the, the year like, okay, what are the words of intent for me? Um, that's definitely something I, I've uh, tried to practice. Um, it, it's interesting that the, the core, those core values and what's come and gone along the way. I've um, just thinking back on, on Caitlin's uh, question about like how, you know, has reflecting on your values shifted your career trajectory? Yeah. I think that if I hadn't started doing that, I would probably still be at Microsoft because between 2000 and 2010, Microsoft was a very different organization. Um, and it wasn't as um, welcoming or uh, inclusive of the design community as it is now. Um, we were trying, but it, it was just a, a very different, uh, there was a very different leadership um, rubric and because I reflected on those values, uh, it's what made, motivated me to actually leave Microsoft and go join an organization called Filter, which that's really where I added the value of compassion and mentorship because it, it helped me kind of look at this career of design and UX in a very different light and you know, see that there's more than one path and more than one journey to do this and everybody's kind of figuring it out on their own um so yeah i think it's it's a very powerful thing and it, it however you do it however you choose to do it it's true for you and you'll get something out of it cool any last questions Just check in the chat Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, we have about 10 minutes left. We'll do a little, you know, now for something completely different. Um, Angel, you're welcome to chime in as much as you like on these. This Thank is you. more kind of, um, kind of, uh, you know, we'll have a little tongue in cheek moment for storytelling. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, 
please don't write a story that sounds like everyone else is on the internet. Um, hiring managers might, like myself, we see these all the time. There's kind of, it's getting to be like this cookie cutter uh, mindset around like how people write their LinkedIn stuff. Um, that's funny, like I, <laughs> I saw this on Twitter years ago, but I still remember it to this day. Like I'm showing how unique and non-conformist I am by wearing the same Fred Perry lumberjack shirt and American apparel slash we use everybody else. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny, but if you think this is ridiculous, um, how many people have an intro story that's a derivative of this? I'm a talented foe with background in blah, who's passionate about solving real problems for real people. I love working with this and I have skills in that. I'm well-versed in those things and I have strength in stuff. My career dream is to do things for this place that are useful, intuitive, usable, delightful. Uh oh, design thinking. Now, it's this is an extreme parody example, but the point is like, try to avoid information that would apply to lots of people. You know, make it about you. <clears throat> Have the courage to say something unique about people. I mean, seriously, I've actually, I've had to do this myself. If you're having trouble coming up with something because it's one of the hardest things to do to write honestly about yourself. Have a friend, a peer, a colleague, somebody who knows you really well, not your mother, have somebody ghostwrite something for you because you'd be amazed to hear what they think about you. It's similar to the values exercise. You can start there and then you can turn it into prose. Like, hey, you know, why don't we write each other's bio? And the way you get practice in doing that is start offering recommendations to people on LinkedIn. Just send them a recommendation. Guess what? Chances are they're going to send one back to you and they're going to reflect what they see in you back and it's amazing <clears throat> um so one of the things that we did you've you may have seen this little survey that we sent out we probably should have sent it out earlier oh well um but we did a little research to see like what are those common words that keep bubbling up in these you know about me things and <clears throat> even filtering out the like designer ux user experience whatever you know those classic things there's a lot of the same words that keep bubbling up in these about me statements. Um, and granted, statistics significance is here. We've got like a total of maybe 41 by five o'clock today. We'll see what it looks like. Not all of these are bad. Some of these are necessary, but <clears throat> you want to at least try and find a way to use them in a way that feels less cookie cutter. You know? Craft a story that showcases your unique value. I, I'm not talking about like, hey, I'm Roy, I'm a Sagittarius. I like long walks in the rain. and I, I don't care about that. Well, I kind of do. It's fun. But <clears throat> focus on this is what I believe in. This is the work I love doing. And here's what I can contribute to your company. Oh, this, this is Angel, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, so piggybacking off of what Joy has mentioned about this, this next slide, um, don't pollinate your prose with cliches, idioms, or buzzwords. So um, I have been guilty at, of this at some point in my career. Yes, we all have. Let's raise our hands for it. But, you know, I am a creative, um, I am a creative, um, empathetic um, user experience designer with experience in XYZ, and I want to create these human-centered yeah, well, yeah, yada, yada, yada. Like, ev there are a lot of portfolios, a lot of personal statements that sound like this. And we would like to hope that if you are entering this career path, that you do embody those things. Um, but I think what we would like to emphasize for the storytelling aspect is that you have something so unique and so special to offer your future employer. And that's what they want to hear. Um, you know, I think, Troy, you had a really interesting um, kind of comment on the word empathy the last time that, that we chatted. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, it, it's funny just seeing the evolution of word usage just in our own discipline. Um, there was a time where I was a huge fan of the word empathy, designed for empathy, and we got to, you know, empathy for the users. And about three years ago, I kind of got burned out on the word empathy because it was 
really being overused and it was being used by people who didn't really understand what it meant. And um, because I, I lean on my mentors a lot and I was just having a discussion with one of my mentors uh, about this. And she actually said, <clears throat> I actually don't like the word empathy because it doesn't motivate people to do anything. It's one step away from sympathy. And she said, I, I prefer the word compassion. I was like, well, what's the difference? Said, well, empathy is passive. Empathy is I'm feeling what you're feeling in a way that I can relate. And I, I, I feel it as though it's happening to me. That's not compassion. Compassion is I'm feeling what you're going through or experiencing so deeply that it's compelling me to do something about it, to take action. And that's where the beauty of the language comes out in terms of really digging in. And this is also a benefit and an opportunity for people who are maybe still trying to learn English. There's such a, there's such a wide range of words to use that aren't really well known, but you can dig into those and go, that better captures what I'm talking about. And as long as it's not a, you know, a, a word that, you know, there's a lot of English words that nobody ever know, uses anymore or uses wrong, like, you know, decimate. Um, but I mean, there's, you have a choice, you have a choice and you don't have to fall victim to, you know, this. And if your story reads or sounds like this, this is not gonna do you any favors. And for the record, I didn't write this. This is, this is written by an algorithm on some website. I just literally went click and it gave me this crap. So <clears throat> think about how are you using plain language and simple terminology as much as possible? So they don't have to work so hard to think about what your value is. Do you see Caitlin's hand? Angel, Dory? I do now. Oh, sorry. I, I did have a question. Can I ask? Um, so um, I'm also a career changer and I, I'm, I don't want to scare people away. <laughs> My, <laughs> so if you could speak a little bit to, for people coming in kind of from a very slant wise, I know that I bring a lot of value with my diverse um, background, but I'm also trying to make myself, and I think someone had a question about like both figuring out how to stand out and fit in. <laughs> like, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you can speak to like how much, I'm never sure how much to be like, hello, <laughs> I have a variety of very unique experiences and I can do what you want me to do. Yeah, that's a tough one. I will say that I will say that there is probably space for you to tell a really quick narrative of that, you know, the pre-career change you when you introduce yourself in something like um, an on-site interview. There is space and room for that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think like it's, to it's absolutely fine to talk about being a career changer too. Like that's, that's something that's going to s set you apart. I think it might be useful or I think it might be helpful to kind of reflect on like those highlights or those key things that you've learned about, learned from your past career and how, maybe how it translates into um, UX research or design or, you know, whatever, um, your next career path is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. I think it, you know, if, we're to, <clears throat> if I were to use the principle from Swiss School of Design, it's a fierce reduction of unnecessary elements. I, I, you know, I managed a blockbuster video at one point in my, you know, in my youth. Nobody cares, and it doesn't really have a lot of bearing, other than like, you know, when I'm dealing with irate stakeholders, it might help, but you know, it doesn't really have any bearing on my story as it is now. So knowing how much research you've done to figure out, okay, this is what this company values. This is the focus of what this role is. This is what they're expecting. And being able to go and cherry pick those points of honor from your legacy to go, this is what brings me to the table with a unique perspective. 
<clears throat> and I think Thanks. there was a, uh, how might you communicate that you fit in and stand out? I don't know that I want to fit in, but that's just me. I mean, uh, I want to be able to stand out in a way that shows that like I have something unique to bring to the table because if I'm part of an organization and the organization wants everybody to fit in and be in the same box and cookie cutter, what does that say about the, the team's ability and agency to be creative and think outside that box and be their authentic selves? Or are we literally just looking at a scenario of group thing? Maybe I don't want to work there. I'm just taking a look at the other questions. How do you get past the first cut in which a computer and not a human is looking for those key buzzwords? Good question. They're not going to look for it in your about me statement. The algorithm, <clears throat> those HR tools, they're going to do a scrub of keywords versus your resume. Um, so I would worry less about what's in your personal statement and always submit a cover letter. You know, it's always, it's a good practice. Um, but your resume should be specifically oriented to, I need to make sure that this aligns to the job description, but not so much that you're actually like copying and pasting literal bullet points from the job description, don't do that. And also build your network too. Build yes. your network, learn about different companies, learn about different teams at different companies, learn about culture at different companies. Um, mm -hmm. and that's very important. That's one thing that I think has helped me a lot in, in my career is just building a network and you have access to that at HCDE. Yep. Okay. So we're all, uh, just checking on time. I think we have just a couple more quick ones. Um, this, uh, also speak to to Angel's point about like, you'll have time and space to talk about the other things in an in-person interview, on a screening call and phone conversations, Zoom calls. Um, there's a right how you speak thing, but there's also this tendency that people will try to cram everything they can into their written about statement. Don't do that. Um, especially when we're dealing with what I call table stakes skills. If you're a designer, hiring managers assume that by now you've learned one of the popular design tools relatively well. If you're a researcher, we assume you know how to use SurveyMonkey type form, good Google Forms, you, you get the point. The whole table stakes skills. And here's a caveat. If you're getting rejected because the team uses Sketch and you know Figma, count your blessing because they don't really understand what they're looking for when it comes to design talent. Um, oh, and if you insist on listing these skills in your resume, please don't do this ever, like don't. I mean, seriously, what does this say to you about a hiring manager, to, to a hiring manager about you? Other than I have no idea how data visualization works. My two favorite things about this example are the 16 point scale because wow. And a complete lack of any use, universal context. I'm like seven out of 16 in photography. What are you comparing against? Like, okay, so if Elliot Erwitt or Dorothea Lang or Gordon Parks or any Leibovitz or 16s, then that means you're a I don't know. just stop. Just please just stop. Don't do this. Tell this just um, and finally, um, Angela and I have uh, uh, are both big believers of this. Like write for content, edit for story. Your first draft is your worst draft. Last but not least, one of the things I'll close with, one of my theater coaches always told me, um, other than Honey, open your mouth. You're, you're chewing your words. Enunciate, please, darling. Um, he said, rehearse, 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 rehearse. And when you think you're ready, rehearse two more times. Nothing replaces practice and repetition builds skill. Angel, any last thoughts? Um, yeah, put yourself out there. Apply for, apply for a lot of different jobs using these different stories that you have, see what works. It will change, your story will change. Um, and just get a lot of practice telling that story. Um, and other than that, 
Thank you so much, Drory. And thank you all for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting us, um, Melissa. It was great. I loved it. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm happy to hang out and answer more questions for anybody who wants to stay over. And you now we can just kibitz. Thank you so much. And thanks so much to Drory and Angel. We're so grateful for this fabulous um, storytelling event. Um, I can send everybody the resources um, uh, right either after this or first thing in the morning, everybody who registered.